Convolutional neural networks are a machine learning tool that uses layers of convolution and pooling to process and classify inputs. CNNs are useful for identifying objects in images and video. In this episode, we discuss the application of convolutional neural networks to image and video recognition and classification. Matt Zeiler is the CEO of Clarify, an API for image and video recognition. Matt takes us through the basics of a convolutional neural network. You don't need any background in machine learning to understand the content of this episode. Matt also discusses the subjective aspects of image and video recognition and some of the tactics that Clarify has explored. This is far from a solved problem. There's lots of exploration and experimentation to be done. Matt also discusses the infrastructure of Clarify, how they use Kubernetes, how models are deployed, and how models are updated. Artificial intelligence is dramatically evolving the way that our world works. And to make AI easier and faster, we need new kinds of hardware and software, which is why Intel acquired Nirvana Systems and its platform for deep learning. Intel Nirvana is hiring engineers to help develop a full stack for AI, from chip design to software frameworks. Go to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash intel to apply for an opening on the team. To learn more about the company, check out the interviews that I've conducted with its engineers. Those are also available at softwareengineeringdaily.com slash intel. Come build the future with Intel Nirvana. Go to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash intel to apply now. Matt Zeiler is the CEO of Clarify. Matt, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thanks for having me. Your company, Clarify, specializes in computer vision, and I want to work our way towards some of the modern techniques and the modern applications, but let's start with some older ideas within computer vision. Before all of the excitement around neural nets and deep learning, what were people doing for computer vision? So way back, it was a lot of hand-engineered algorithms. And when I say way back, it was really up until the last four years when people were using handcrafted algorithms for computer vision. And that means things like edge detection, color histogram, deformable part models where they have some kind of springs in them to align different parts of objects in order to recognize them. Those types of things where you kind of have a preconceived notion of what would be important for recognizing things within images and so you build the engineered algorithm for that and that's much different than neural nets was simply learned from the data so the older computer vision applications were not something that you would call machine learning yeah that's correct for the most part it was more hand engineered stuff and that's not to say you know machine learning was just invented in the last four years the algorithms for machine learning are also many decades old but they weren't the preferred algorithm for computer vision up until recently. What does that term machine learning mean to you? I think of it as being a synonym to just learning from data. That's why it's machines learning from the data. It's pattern recognition that the algorithms, instead of hard coding examples, they can actually learn these patterns directly from looking at many training examples that have been labeled by humans and they can extract those common patterns and learn a representation for those common patterns within the model. And so there's lots of different types of machine learning algorithms and and neural nets that are thrown out more recently as as the go-to algorithm are just one algorithm within machine learning. Linear regression is core to how machine learning works. Explain what linear regression is. Yeah, you can think of it as actually a one-layer neural network is just fitting a single weight to your input. So your input could be a vector of numbers, let's say, and those numbers might be the pixels of an image or they might be a collection of stock prices or something, some kind of signal. And you want to optimize a weight vector that when you dot product with your input vector, it gives you a high score when it's a positive example and a low score when it's a negative example. Mm -hmm. And so linear regression helps solve that problem. Explain how linear regression fits into machine learning. How is it applied in machine learning? Yeah, I mean, that's 
It's one type of algorithm within machine learning, and typically it's used for simpler problems where you don't need lots of layers of understanding and representation in order to extract a more complex signal. One of the other benefits is it can be a very large parameter space. So you can have lots of different inputs and it scales well. And there's lots of, you know, both engineering toolkits and algorithms to support really high dimensional linear regression problems. But it sounds like linear regression is maybe not as applicable or not as effective for image recognition. Is that accurate? Or an image processing? Yeah. So if you look at for example, a large picture and there's a dog and a tree and a mountain or something like that, there's a huge level of abstraction that the mind does when it sees those pixels and says, oh, that's a dog and that's a tree and that's the, the sun or the mountains. It's going through lots of processing to do that. And when you think of linear regression, it's really only going through one layer of processing to do what it does. And when you think of a neural net, it goes through many, many layers, and that's what makes neural nets more powerful for image recognition versus just linear regression. And when you look at what a neural net learns, it actually learns things that are pretty logical as it builds up these higher level representations for understanding images. Things like edges and colors are learned in the very first layer, and that's something you probably could learn with some linear model where it's just applied to patches of images, but these neural networks applied to images learn this in the first layer without even having some constraint on that the fact that it should learn edges or it should learn colors they just naturally do that and then by the second layer it starts building edges and colors into things like circles and corners and parallel lines and then by the third layer it'll start building things like eyeballs and fingers and and hands and stuff like that and then higher layers might build a face or a arm and then the top layer might output person is likely to be in this picture. So that's the power of having multiple layers versus linear regression, which is can be considered as one layer of a neural net. Mm -hmm. In machine learning, we are interested in building models. So for Clarify, these models are trained by processing images one by one. How does the process of getting a single image integrated with the model Give me an overview of that process and how it relates to the construction of the model that you're actually developing over time with multiple images. Yeah, so the way these algorithms are trained is, for example, our general model has seen over 10 million images that have been labeled by humans. And in the training process, it goes through those millions of images in small batches. So it's not one at a time, but more like 128 at a time, for example. It's pretty much as much as you can fit on one graphics card which we use for training because it's very parallelizable, very efficient. So the more you can throw at the GPU, the better. And so as it gets these 128 images, it runs them through the current state of the model and it outputs its best guess at that time. And off the start of training, all the model's parameters are just random. So instead of having nice edges and colors in the first layer, it just has random initialized parameters that don't look like anything in particular. And so its best guess is basically random probability for each of the output categories that you care about recognizing. It compares those guesses with the ground truth labels that a human has provided, and that gives it its error. It's That's the mistakes it's currently making. And then there's a bunch of basically calculus that you learn in undergrad in university that same calculus defines how you take that error signal and update all of those parameters throughout your model. And it, you make a small adjustment to each of the parameters, not a huge one because you've only seen one or 128 images in this small batch. You don't want to just memorize those images and, and only optimize on them. So you make a small update to your parameters and then you move on to the next batch. And using the new parameters, you go through, make your guess, correct the errors and make a small adjustment to your parameters and you loop through your whole data set of millions of images in that way. And so over time it starts learning common patterns in things like this is a dog and it's a dog because it recognizes these edges in the first layer, these corners in the second layer and so forth in higher layers. And so that's, that's kind of the training algorithm that builds up from these incremental improvements on small sets of images to learning from a huge collection of images. Mm -hmm. 
So you have touched on elements of a neural network, and the last several years have seen growth in the adoption of neural networks. Can you give a formal explanation for what a neural network is? Well, it's an algorithm. It's just a computer algorithm, and it's meant to simulate how the brain works. That's where it gets its name, neural. But nobody really knows how the brain works, so it's a best guess, best approximation. And it's composed just like the brain is in multiple layers of processing. So when you see an uh, image come through your eyes, it actually has very similar layers that recognize edges and colors. Then they get composed into uh, mid-level primitives like corners and circles and stuff like that. And then much deeper into the brain after multiple layers, then it starts recognizing high-level things like dog and tree. And so these neural nets work, as I explained, in a very similar way. But it's, again, just an algorithm that has a very simple mathematical model. It has these update rules are called gradients because they're just calculus based on how you want to change your parameters in order to optimize your accuracy. So it works out to be pretty simple calculus from school. And the adjective that often gets prepended to neural network is convolutional neural network. Explain what convolutional neural networks are. Yeah, that's right. So for images and video and other types of data that has kind of local patterns, like edges and colors and, and neighboring patterns, convolutional neural networks work very well. And that's because convolutional networks have what are called filters that are small regions of weights. And those are applied over every location in the image, just like template matching. So Think of them as templates that you're just going to slide over every possible location of pixels in the image, and when they overlap very nicely with the underlying pixels, that gives you a strong response that gets passed to the next layer. And so you can think of convolutions as simply template matching. And when you picture that, these templates sliding over images, it makes a lot of sense why they work well for images, because you know they become invariant to things like the dog is in the left side of the picture or the dog is on the right side of the picture. If you slide the same template over all parts of the picture, you're going to eventually line up with the dog really well. And so it's going to find that dog regardless of where it is in the picture. Mm -hmm. And that's why they work much better than just applying the traditional type of neural network, which is often called a fully connected neural network because it's fully connected to all of the pixels. That doesn't have that same property where when you move an object within the image, it can no longer use the same weights. It can't share those same template weights. And so it makes it much more difficult for that type of neural network to learn images and video, which are inherently kind of translation invariant, as I described. For more than 30 years, DNS has been one of the fundamental protocols of the internet. Yet, despite its accepted importance, it has never quite gotten the due that it deserves. But today's dynamic applications, hybrid clouds, and volatile internet demand that you rethink the strategic value and importance of your DNS choices. Oracle Dyn provides DNS that is as dynamic and intelligent as your applications. Dyn DNS gets your users to the right cloud service, the right CDN, or the right data center, using intelligent response to steer traffic based on business policies, as well as real-time internet conditions, like the security and the performance of the network path. Dyn maps all internet pathways every 24 seconds via more than 500 million trace routes. This is the equivalent of 7 light years of distance, or 1.7 billion times around the circumference of the Earth. With over 10 years of experience supporting the likes of Netflix, Twitter, Zappos, Etsy, and Salesforce, Dyn can scale to meet the demand of the largest web applications. Get started with a free 30-day trial for your application by going to dyn.com slash sedaily. That's d-y-n dot com slash sedaily. After the free trial, Dyn's developer plans start at just $7 a month for world-class DNS. Rethink DNS. 
Go to dyn.com slash sedaily to learn more and get your free trial of Dyn DNS. So my understanding is you take an image... You turn that image into its mathematical representation, so it looks like a bunch of numbers, and then you have these different matrices that you you perform some sort of calculation between the smaller matrices across this different image, and these smaller matrices serve as, quote, edge filters, and these edge filters help you outline different regions in the picture and then you can build up a higher level understanding that is not just the pixel wise understanding of that image in subsequent layers of the network. Yeah, that's exactly right. And to give you some rough numbers, if the image is like 256 by 256 pixels, these small template filters, they might be five by five or seven by seven or even three by three. So just small portions of the image. And that's because, again, there's multiple layers to these neural networks, and there's going to be filters just like those ones that apply to the pixels that apply in higher layers to the responses from the lower layers. And that's how it builds up these higher level representations for dogs and trees and so forth. And the term convolution is derived from the word convolve. Explain what we're convolving and what what that actually means in this context. Yeah, it's a mathematical term that is used in signal processing for sliding over a window over top of another signal. And so in this case, the window is the filters, and they're being slid over top of the overall image. And when it matches, it's doing a dot product, essentially, in order to match. And that's just multiplying the weights with the underlying values of the pixels. And when they line up very well, you get a strong response value. So that's all convolution is. There's a related term, correlation. They just basically flip the filters with each other, but it's just doing correlation. And I think that's a more common term used in English than than convolution, but they're very closely related, and they're all just mathematical signal processing terms. So we take an image, like a picture of a dog, and we take all these edge filters, and we convolve these edge filters over the picture of a dog, and it gives us a set of edges. So let's say we convolve a set of vertical edge filters and then a set of horizontal edge filters and a set of diagonal edge filters. And so we start to build up these different understandings of that image in a pixel-wise fashion. We get horizontal edges, we get vertical edges, we get diagonal edges. So what do we do with this collection of edges? Yeah, so... To make a bit of a distinction, so you mentioned you know horizontal, vertical, and diagonal, and there's going to be many more than that in practice. So as you apply each one of these filters to the image, it creates what we call a feature map, which is all of the responses of sliding that filter over the image at each location. And so that feature map, there's one feature map for every type of filter you have. The horizontal will produce one feature map, the vertical will re- produce another, and so forth. And they are roughly the same size as the original image. So they're much bigger than the filters themselves. So that's that's a convolution layer, and that's where the convolutional neural net gets its name. But there's other types of layers that become important as you think of building up this whole neural network. Another one that we haven't discussed is what we call a pooling layer. And it's pooling because it groups together small regions of these activations that were produced from the previous layer and does something like either average them or take the maximum element. And max pooling typically works better. So you look at all the values in, say, a 3 by 3 region of these feature maps, and you simply take the strongest one. So you only get one value for every nine values. And what that does is shrink the size of the feature map down by a factor of 3. And sometimes these regions overlap, so it might be less than 3. But then That's the type of layer that helps with this invariance to where exactly in the image the object appears. So if you think of it visually, you could have the dog on the far left of the pooling region or the dog on the far right. As long as that activation is the strongest activation, it's still going to be relayed up to the next layer in the stack of neural net layers. And so 
then that just gives you smaller size feature maps, the same number as was in the previous yeah. output from the convolution layer. And then you typically repeat this process. There's other types of layers that are less important, like just keeping all the positive elements is a, actually an important one, but it's very simple. You just throw away negatives. But those are the, kind of the building blocks. You, you stack multiple of these layers up. So you might have another convolution layer, another pooling layer, another positive layer maybe multiple convolution layers back to back. And that's where kind of the expertise, like the people at Clarify here have come to know over time how to actually build and architect these neural networks in the right way with the right number and proportion of layers, the right size of these layers, like how many of these filters you actually want in each layer and so forth. And so it's not just convolutions, there's multiple types of layers and many layers to get to the final prediction at the end. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about, like, let's just take the first, like, if we're talking about the first convolution where you, let's say, the the feature maps that we're getting are the vertical edges and the horizontal edges and the diagonal edges and perhaps some other feature maps that we're developing. And then, as you said, perhaps after that we're doing a pooling, which will condense a feature map, like a vertical edge feature map. So at the pooling stage, is there any, are we doing any sort of interaction between the different feature maps that we've developed in the first stage, or are we just retaining these different feature maps through the different layers of the of the network? That's a great question. Typically, what people do is they don't pool across different feature maps. We actually tried that. Rob Fergus, who is my PhD advisor, and myself at NYU tried this during my PhD, and we found mixed results. The benefit of pooling across or pooling together multiple features is that you can speed up processing because now you have less information to pass to the next layer, but it just didn't learn as good of a representation. It wasn't as accurate at the end of the day. And so it's possible, but it doesn't seem to work quite as well. So do you throw out any of these feature maps throughout this? Because So you're, you're alternating between this convolution and pooling and convolution and pooling, or do you have the same set of features throughout each different no, uh, each yeah. different phase of comp okay. Yeah, so that that's a key point as well. So, if you think of the first layer, the image itself, you have red, green, and blue. So you have three color channels. So you, essentially, if you think of the pixels themselves as feature maps, you have three in the first. The input to the first layer is three, and then you get to decide how many outputs of that first convolution layer you want. And typically, it might be sixty-four, ninety-six, one twenty-eight, something like that. And then you do pooling that keeps that same number. You do rectified linear, which is just keeping the positives, and that will keep the same number of feature maps. And then the next convolution layer, you get to choose again how many outputs of that layer. So it might take in 64 or whatever the output of the first layer is, but then you get to choose. Maybe you want it to be 128 or 256. And so that's another dimension, another hyperparameter, we call it, that goes into tuning the capacity of these architectures. You're free to choose that, and that controls kind of the, the amount of information that flows up through the network. Mm. As you go through these stages of convolution and pooling and convolution and pooling, eventually you get to a higher level understanding of the contents of that image. Help me understand how you get to that. Yeah, so the final few layers of the neural network typically aren't doing convolution anymore. You can still think of it as convolution, but at that point, because of these pooling layers that keep reducing the size of the feature maps, the size often gets all the way down to one by one. So there's no more spatial extent. It's basically one pixel. It's the only information flowing through. And that, that other dimension that you can control, the number of feature maps in the layer, typically it's really big at that size. So you, you squish together all the, the number of rows and number of columns, but you explode the number of features. And so that lets it learn lots of different categories, for example, and the differences between fine grain categories. And so that final layer is the number of features corresponds exactly to the number of categories that you want to recognize. And then finally, the outputs are normalized in some way, typically, so that instead of just giving you kind of the floating point range that you would get from the mathematical operation, you want to normalize it to be probabilities. And you can do that in multiple different ways. You might make make it sum to one so that out of all the different 
possible concepts in your vocabulary, you want them to add together to have unit probability. Another possible way, and that's what we do at Clarify, is, is normalize each one of them to be independent. So that way you can have, in a single image, you can have things like a dog and a tree and a mountain all appear in the same image. Whereas if you normalize them to sum to one, they kind of conflict with each other. Mm. Okay, so I want to just try to get a better understanding of this because we've been talking about the idea of like building up an understanding of where the edges are in a picture. And now we're talking about identifying whether a mountain or a tree exists in this picture. How do you bridge the gap between those two different things? Because those, those seem like very different, very different problems. And perhaps it, it involves, you know, getting multiple images going through this model and, you know, having some sort of phase where we're identifying what a collection of edges aggregates to. Can you just shed more light on that? Sure. So this is the beauty of neural nets. It's we don't have to actually phrase it in the algorithm or define how that comes together. We simply feed it after we configure, you know, the number of layers, how wide each layer, the different types of layers. That's kind of the experimental process. But then you just feed it pixels and categories and it learns the rest. And that's a really important point because it, it is very complex. And this is where the hand engineered algorithms fell apart. You could reason about different ways of grouping together edges and colors and simple stuff like that. But at some point, it gets too complex. You don't understand how to actually build up a high level representation that's flexible enough to recognize a dog. And the dog could be, you know, running or sitting or sleeping. It could be in different colors, different types of fur different breeds of dogs. There's lots of different things that come in together that a human would classify a dog being present. And so that's the type of stuff that's really hard to program. And that's where neural networks shine. And that's why they're such a powerful tool for a lot of different problems. Because if you have the right data, you can apply it and it will learn what's important from the data. And so it can make that leap from the well understood stuff, low down in the network, all the way up to predicting the categories that you care about. Right. And one key part of this is that the input to the neural network is typically labeled images. So you have a large set of labeled images and some human has said that, oh, this image contains dog, this image contains tree, and the job of the neural network is to find sets of edges or sets of features that correlate with those labels so you know it can find a set of edges you know it'll find a set of edges or a set of features and and it'll say oh okay well this image you know this image has this set of features and it'll look at the labels and it'll say okay dog so the set of features correlates with dog yeah exactly and that's why it's really important to have a really high quality data set in mm -hmm. order to get a really high quality model that is trained from it. And so that's something we did very early on at, at Clarify is start writing web crawlers, collecting lots of data, mm. making sure it's high quality labels on the data. And that's something that's really important to understand. It's not necessarily the quantity of data. It's not like you can just crawl the web and do a very broad crawl and get high quality data. You really need good sources of data that go into producing a good quality model because ultimately that's what it's learning from is taking those pixels taking those hand labeled categories and trying to learn the rest for you and this feature of neural nets this learning capacity is really exciting because it opens up lots of possibilities for example we have customers in the medical domain and we don't employ any you know medical doctors within clarify and we don't need to because our customers can be the experts in their field. They can label data however they categorize it. And they can be experts that have gone to school for 12 years or whatever it takes to become a doctor these days. And then the model is learned from that data. And it can learn to predict these very complicated things that take many years to, to become experts at very quickly and very easily for the model because it's just a pattern recognition machine. And so that's what makes it really exciting because it would be very hard for us to define the differences between different diseases if we were to sit down and think about it and program it, whereas the neural net can just learn from experience. So if I got a bunch of 
optometrists or, or ophthalmologists, I guess, in, in a room, and I gave them a bunch of, you know, I gave them a stack of photos of eyes, and I told them to identify whether this eye has diabetic retinopathy or not, and I got some consensus around that, and then, or, or even I could just take photos where there are confirmed cases of diabetic retinopathy. I could feed it into a convolutional neural network, and the network would learn what are the trends that are that what are the the visual trends that that tend to in terms of the picture that tend to correlate with diabetic retinopathy. How do you validate that a model has developed an accurate enough understanding of what diabetic retinopathy, for example, is? Ah, great question. So. Typically, what we do is split all of the data that we have available into two different sets. And I mentioned the training set already. That's the stuff we have labeled really well, and that's typically high volume. The more data you have that's really well labeled, the better the model in general that you'll get. But then we hold out a set of data that's typically called a validation set or a test set that the model doesn't get to see when it's training. And so you can evaluate the performance of the model on that held out data to see how well it's learned. And that is really important because what you can do if you have a really big model with lots of parameters that can learn and a very small data set, you can literally memorize the whole data set. The models have that much capacity that it'll learn very subtle things that probably a human wouldn't key on in order to memorize it, but the model has enough capacity to do that. And so, if it just memorizes the training set, it's going to do very poorly on the new data in the test set that it hasn't seen before. And so that's why it's important to hold it out of the training process and evaluate your accuracy on that held out data. Mm-hmm. We've described the general technology that underpins image recognition at this point, and I would, I would love to get a, f- a finer understanding of you know, some of the subjective decisions that you've made in in building models at Clarify, because obviously there's a lot more nuance than we have covered in our survey of this technology in this conversation so far. Let's talk about how this translates to some of the applications that you've built at Clarify. So, for example, you have a model that can detect different pieces of apparel. So I can send it an image, and it will say, there is a probability of 0.8 that this image contains a turtleneck. Explain how you trained that as an example. Yeah, so it all starts with identifying a need in the world and then getting data to to build a model to solve that. And so we talk to a lot of customers. We're fortunate to have a lot of inbound, which is great. We do a lot of outbound with the sales team to reach out to different customers in different industries. And so, you know, fashion and apparel is one of our customer bases. And they help educate us on the different types of categories that they care about recognizing. And that could be you know, their product catalog on their actual retail page or their just the way they organize their warehouse. There's lots of different applications and the catalog might have different categorization depending on that. And then typically for some of our big enterprise customers, they have data already available that they've manually labeled according to these different categories. If they don't have data available, we can also collect data on their behalf. And that's really valuable for them, saves them a lot of time, saves them a lot of money in getting AI into their platform. And then once the data is collected, we train a model. And then it, usually the final stage before getting put into our platform is going through quality control checks. We look at things like the accuracy on held out data. We look just qualitatively. And this is where we use the demo you see on our site internally to check the quality of our models before we release them to the world. Do they handle the common use cases? What about some edge cases? Does the vocabulary make sense for the application and so forth? So there's a lot of kind of steps to the process. And then the final step is documenting it and getting it into our demos. People can see it and start integrating it into their products. Don't let your database be a black box. Drill down into the metrics of your database with one second granularity. Vivid Cortex provides database monitoring for MySQL, Postgres, Redis, MongoDB, and Amazon Aurora. 
Database uptime, efficiency, and performance can all be measured using VividCortex. VividCortex uses patented algorithms to analyze and surface relevant insights, so users can be proactive and fix performance problems before customers are impacted. If you have a database that you would like to monitor more closely, check out vividcortex.com slash sedaily, GitHub, DigitalOcean, and Yelp all use VividCortex to understand database performance. Learn more at vividcortex.com slash sedaily and request a demo. Thank you to VividCortex for being a repeat sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. It means so much to us. I wanted to train something that was more niche like if I wanted to train a model to recognize specific beanie babies I mean how self-serve can you make that obviously the dream is to build the generalizable platform where I mean people are getting more of an understanding for how these models work and training and whatnot but so it's still a pretty long way from where you can build something that's self-serve because Talk about nuance, you have to really, with with a lot of nuance, explain to the customers, hey, here is how you can build your own thing. It sounds like we're still sort of at the era where it's it, you, you don't want to make it completely self-serve because you need to do a lot of stuff for the customer. But you know, so if a customer wanted to build a specific Beanie Baby identifier, to what degree can you make that a self-serve thing? Yeah, we actually launched a product in the fall that does exactly this and we like to call it custom training and we don't actually have a demo of it unfortunately on our site it's something we're working on currently but it lets our customers customize the platform so they can recognize they can teach it to recognize whatever they care about and we phrase it in the same the same words people upload images they label them with different concepts and then they train a model based on those images and concepts that are labeled in order to recognize the concepts that they care about. And then they can apply that trained model on any new images that they feed into the APIs. And beyond just the APIs, all that, everything I just said is available as APIs, but we also made a user interface so it's even simpler to use. And that lets you just create a Clarify account. You can sign up for free and you don't even need a credit card. And you'll see a link to what we call our preview UI. It lets you view all of your data, lets you even drag and drop data off your desktop. And then it starts, indexes it for search so you can organize it. And then it lets you train whatever you want to. And so some of the objectives of launching that product were to remove the roadblocks that we see in training artificial intelligence today. And we view it as five different big roadblocks that are really hindering people training AI and reaching that point that you just mentioned. So one of them is you need lots of code if you want to build something yourself. It's typically you download some open source toolkit and you customize it and it's a lot of configuration. So you really need to have a team of data scientists that know what they're doing and can actually set up the data pipeline the right way and configure these neural networks. You also, so that's the second thing, it's a team of data scientists. The third thing is the special hardware. We use graphics cards to train our neural networks and they need optimized code. They need different types of monitoring and maintenance. And so we take care of that in our API. And typically to train a new category of thing, you want a thousand examples per concept that you want to recognize. And we want to get rid of all that because it hinders you from doing things like teaching it the name of your dog because you probably don't have thousands of pictures of them readily available. And then the final roadblock is it takes weeks of time to either get all of these different factors together or to, to train every iteration of the model. And so we want to make that significantly faster. And now it's down to literally seconds to teach the platform and just a few images. And you don't need special hardware. You don't need any knob tuning or data balancing or anything like that. We take care of it for you. And in our APIs, it's literally only six lines of code. It's very simple to use. And then with the user interface, you don't even have to write a single line of code. So we've factored out all these different roadblocks to AI and made it very simple for you to customize it and get exactly what you want. We've been talking about image recognition and image analysis. 
you also have APIs for video. You've done a lot of work in the video analysis and prediction space. Since we've already explored the convolutional neural network approach for image deconstruction, can you explain how well that relates to video analysis and and what you have to do differently when it comes to video? Sure. So convolutional neural nets also work very well for video. And you can think of it as just another dimension. So you have the number of rows and number of columns in your images, and that's each frame of video is essentially an image. But then there's the time dimension, so it's a third dimension. And some people do three-dimensional convolutions. So instead of just a template over the rows and columns, there's a template dimension over time as well. That sometimes works good, sometimes it's just very inefficient because it's a very expensive computationally. And so other people do things like run on every frame of video, run a regular image convolutional neural network, and then at high up in the network start connecting over time. And that's something we do at Clarify. That makes it kind of a blend between efficient and accurate. I would love to talk more about the data engineering side of things because you mentioned all of the complexity involved in that. You kind of glossed over it, but training convolutional neural networks is computationally expensive. How do you keep the costs down and what does your infrastructure look like? Yeah, we actually went through a big revamp of our infrastructure over the last year. So we have a mix of two different clouds. One is AWS, where we run all of our production traffic, api.clarify.com goes there. And then for training these neural networks, we actually host our own machines over in New Jersey in a colo facility. And so that gives us the, the best of both worlds. For our customers, it's highly reliable and maintained and monitored thanks to AWS, But for the training side, we can have the latest graphics cards installed as they come out. And so we just did that last week, it turns out, drove over to New Jersey and upgraded the the Colo, upgraded the network so that we can train across multiple machines, that kind of stuff, to give us the latest training infrastructure for our research team to push the limits of these neural networks. And so once we have a model that's trained on our Colo, we can push it into production and it's deployed over there in AWS. And so our stack is composed of a lot of Python code for the the neural network side of things. Our APIs are written in Go. We just started doing that over the last year, which is exciting, new language, and it's paying dividends thanks to its, its way it handles lots of requests in parallel. And we deploy all of our code into Kubernetes. So that makes managing lots of different services and doing deployments very easy and and low maintenance. So we got all of that in place over the last has made our, our continuous deployments much faster. Yeah. So I hear around the Kubernetes conversation, how often are you retraining these models? Because if you get a bunch of new data, you could retrain a model. Yeah. It goes through different phases. When we get it into the model gallery, initially it's launched into kind of this preview stage where people can start playing with it. And then as it flows to beta and general availability, there's sometimes tweaks between the models. So that either either is just refining the vocabulary of the concepts that we recognize or collecting more data. So that's usually a tighter iteration. And then after we launch it in GA, we continuously collect more and more data. It's one of our KPIs as a company that we track our key performance indicators. And so it's a big initiative for us to keep improving these models. And then the other KPI that's related is model accuracy. We actually drive that over time. And so it depends a lot on the model and, the, and how quickly we get more data. It could be anywhere from weeks of iteration or months of iteration between model versions. I suppose if you're building a model for diabetic retinopathy or cancer, maybe it's it's more important to update the model more frequently than if you're building a tree detection model. So you can imagine different schemes for updating different, you know, different models at different frequencies. So you mentioned the the Kubernetes stuff. I still don't have a good picture for how in this kind of company, like what's the mapping between a model and the compute nodes that it's deployed against. So do you have like 
is it like one container per model or like a, a I guess a maybe a replicate what is it a replication group per model or something like that or or am I am I envisioning this wrong Yeah no that's that's exactly what we have actually currently we're actually revisiting that in the future but currently we have one deployment per model and it has multiple replicas and that's nice because with kubernetes you can talk between different services just by their dns name and so we have a way we specify our models internally the go apis that serve you know our customers requests translate that request to the underlying model identifier and then it just fires off that to that dns name and it just finds where the neural network is deploy it and then we get a response back and then send it to the user so it makes kind of that that service management and deployment much much simpler than what we had previously what's the workflow between training a model and deploying it i guess are you just training it completely offline and then deploying the model once it's fully trained or are you forking you know every you could also fork every submission to that's going to prod, you could fork that submission to a training, a model that's being trained to update and be deployed. Yeah, I don't know. What, is it, what does that look like? Yeah, the way we do it is more on the offline fashion. We train on the colo, which is a separate deployment, when it's ready, when it's high quality, high accuracy. We can then take the trained model, which is just the parameters, it's not the data, and so then it just needs to be checked into the to our code repo so that you know the new APIs know about it. They know the you know the unique model identifier and all that kind of information that they need to know in order to serve requests for that model. And over time, as we introduce new types of models, there might be code changes as well. For example, we launched celebrity recognition recently, which not only recognizes you know, the names of celebrities, but it actually finds where in the picture the face is of that celebrity. And so it's a different format in the API, different type of model, different requests in the back end, all that kind of stuff. So it has correlated code changes. And so they have to be deployed together. And as things scale up, the all the parameters of the model are, are available to the, the different pods in Kubernetes. So if we have more traffic for one type of model, we can scale up more pods to service that traffic. It seems to me that the bread and butter of a company like like Clarify, I mean, for, obviously you have like the typical challenges like, you know, hiring and infrastructure and stuff. But like what we went over earlier with the the convolutional neural networks, just like deciding how many layers and like what you're tuning, that's really the special sauce. And so it's so it's not like you need to build your own machine learning framework from scratch you could take some machine learning framework or deep learning framework off the shelf i mean maybe you can tell me what we use you know, maybe tensorflow or something but that's less important than the fact that your company has built up a domain expertise in how to construct these models is that accurate yeah, that's right. And that's a big differentiator between trying to build this type of thing yourself in-house. Like if you're a developer at a company, it's much better to, to use a service. And you use this all the time. If, if you think of like sending a text message to do verification of somebody's phone number or email, you use Twilio. If you think of doing payments, you use Stripe. If you think of recognizing things in images or video, you should use Clarify. You shouldn't try and reinvent the wheel. You wouldn't want to write a database in-house, for example. We use RDS, which is hosted in Amazon, has lots of benefits. And so it's not the that's not our expertise in like re-architecting the whole toolkit that serves neural networks. It's how to deploy very high quality models, collect data, and bring that as a very well maintained and easy to use service for our customers. And so internally, actually, when I founded the company in November 2013, the first thing I was working on was our own toolkit, because this was multiple years ago before things like TensorFlow and Theano and Cafe were available and, and well supported. And so now we're actually in this process where we're transitioning between that internal toolkit to one of these external toolkits so that we can get the benefits of the community as well. Can you say which one you're using or do you not know yet? Yeah, we're going to use TensorFlow. Okay. 
I actually did a couple internships at Google Brain, so I know a lot of the engineers who wrote TensorFlow, including Jeff Dean, who was my intern host. So that was a cool experience when I was there. I think they're going to do an awesome job at building something that is very efficient and scalable. That's what they're known for in that team. And so that and I think the community is also kind of rallying around it. They have a big following out there. And so that helps it grow and and integrate with other types of things as well. We've really seen the power of the community with Kubernetes, and it seems like the same thing is going to happen with TensorFlow. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And that's why we actually at Clarify, we were the first people to add GPU support to Kubernetes, and we contributed that back to the community in, I can't remember now, 1.3 or 1.4 release of Kubernetes. That was that was our code by a guy named Rudy here at Clarify. So we love contributing back as well because we know it'll come back around and, and help us in the future as well. I know we're, we're nearing the end of our time. A higher level question. So we're talking about the identification of images and videos or, or things in video or images. How applicable is the technology we're discussing? I, actually, I know it's applicable, but how far along are we in terms of the recreation stuff? Because that's where it starts to get spooky and and where we really have to rethink some of our social norms around digital stuff when you, know, when you can replay somebody's voice or you can recreate somebody's visage in a video. Things start to get really crazy pretty fast. Yeah. There's a lot of interesting progress underway in the research community. And that was actually, the majority of my PhD was actually focused on this. It's what we call unsupervised learning and generative models. So unsupervised means we don't need any labels in order to learn. And so what I was working on was just learning from images directly how to extract patterns. And I did it in a way that would generate images and compare it to the original image. And if it was close, that was that was its uh, learning metric. It had to be close to generating the original image. And so it showed promising results, but people have since had a lot more progress in that regard. And I, I just saw, I don't know who the author was for a paper. I just saw it on Twitter where they converted a video of a horse running around to a video of a zebra running around. I saw that. Uh, I thought that was pretty cool because there's a lot of work on what people are calling generative adversarial networks. And they're showing a lot of promise in being able to generate high quality images and video and other signals like voice. I think there's a lot of promise and we're looking at it as well to see kind of where the opportunity is there. What about speech? Yeah, I think before image and video, it was actually the first thing that really started to work with neural networks around 2012 or so. University of Toronto had some really good results in a few other places as well, applying neural networks to the audio signal. Again, these convolutional neural networks turn out to work really well. Another type of neural net called a recurrent neural network or a long short-term memory recurrent neural network. There's some pretty crazy names in neural net terms, but they take into account time series and iterate using the same parameters over every time step. And so those typically work well for speech recognition. And you're starting to see it in products everywhere. When you talk into your Siri device, your Google Now device, your Alexa device, that's all using speech recognition powered by neural networks. So it's out there, it's working, and it works pretty well. Okay, Matt. Well, I want to thank you for coming on Software Engineering Daily. It's been a real, real educational conversation for me. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Thanks to Symphono for sponsoring Software Engineering Daily. Symphono is a custom engineering shop where senior engineers tackle big tech challenges while learning from each other. Check it out at symphono.com slash sedaily. That's S-Y-M-P-H-O-N-O dot com slash sedaily. Thanks again to Symphono for being a sponsor of Software Engineering Daily for almost a year now. Your continued support allows us to deliver this content to the listeners on a regular basis. Wow!